Uh, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of the, the panel talk. And uh, I think that ends up being some of the highlight of, of the conversations, honestly. So, because um, you as an audience think of all the stuff we didn't think of. So um, stick around for that. Uh, we'll uh, look to keep a full 15 minutes for that uh, Q&A section. And we have some experts here. So uh, with that, I'm gonna launch in and uh, some introductions. First on our list, uh, looking very Christmassy, is Loy Searle. Uh, Loy runs globalization at Workday, and Workday really has quite the team. Um, Loy, last count, 14 people on your team in, in globalization? Or no, 80. 80 people 80, on my 80. team. 80. Oh, shit. 15 <laughs> on your IETN team, I think. Yeah. Wow. You're just, yeah, yeah. It's a big I'm group. Out of touch. I'm out of touch. Wow. And, you know, I uh, was remarking how how much uh, I looked at a quarterly report from Workday and I was talking yesterday with Loy about uh, it was very obvious that uh, Workday is very much a globally positioned company. It was all over their quarterly report and they were reporting like 20 percent growth. So um, pretty good on their part. Um, and that is coming from Loy's team. Making uh, so us very busy. Yes, that's super cool. Um, we have Renato Beninato. And, um, you know, if you don't know Renato, you need to connect to him on LinkedIn. Um, the, the, occasionally, I meet people that don't know Renato. Renato is in the industry longer than me. Uh, we met in 1998 in Ireland. Um, and we had a really good time at the bar. <laughs> we, we go way back. <laughs> Um, I just call him the Grand Poobah. I think I think that should be your title, um, Renato. Um, he is the maven of the industry. He runs uh, uh, NIMSI. He's a co-founder there. So if you want good advice on building the kind of globalization organization that Loy has, you need to work with Renato. And then finally, we have Dave Ruane, last but not least. Uh, Dave is uh, in charge of partnerships. He's been a marketing leader at XTM. He's really on the pulse of a lot of technology uh, within the industry. And also, um, he leads the process innovation chair. And if you've been to Loke World, you know that's a key component. It's, it's, it's a key attraction where people come and they demonstrate their new technologies for all to see and vote on and, and all that. Um, so he's very much plugged in. He's on the board of directors for Gala. So that is the brief list of uh, criteria for um, our guests. Uh, I want to invite you to connect with them on LinkedIn. Uh, don't try to send them those like stupid messages where you send sell them stuff right away because that's annoying. But um, uh, connect with them uh, for, for all good. And you see Renato, he's pointing up here. That's because he's going to help you go all right. Did I do good? All right. Now to our questions. I get to be quiet here, and uh, this is an easy webinar for me, so uh, it's up to you folks. First of all, 2023 was kind of a tumultuous year uh, for many. Others, not so much. Um, but uh, uh, we're going to talk about that and address that. So we're going to take the sad part, and maybe it's not all sad, uh, first. Tell me, who wants to go first? What did you see in 2023, uh, looking at the, the questions I've, I've put here? I'm going to pick on you. Loy, why, why, why okay. don't you start? I'll Talk go. about tech layoffs. <laughs> You're one in the, the tech sector. So I, I, I'm on the client side, so I think I, I think I get this one to start. So, you know, I think almost all of us on the client side, and I think many on the supplier side, experienced um, experience cuts early in the year. And I know for some of some of our peers in the industry that has continued throughout the year or it's it's ramped up again here lately. I do think this has been a strange year. You know, this is um, we spent the first part of the year just wondering what was going to happen. Right. And so there was a lot of preemptive work to to weather what we thought was going to be quite the storm that turned out to not be as big of a storm as I think we were all afraid of. But I, it, at least in where. Where I think many of us are is we're, while we feel like we the worst is past, there is still kind of a cautiousness. There is still kind of a, a, a little bit more conservatism, 
I think, in place around the companies that we're working for. So like we're not hiring tons of people next year. You know, we're we're going to we're going to try to be conservative and stable. And and I think that that's pretty typical in the space right now as we watch to see what's going to happen globally with the economy as we all figure out what you know gen ai is going to do to our worlds and um and navigate kind of a new space uh renato usually have something to say yeah well i i i think that looking at it as as the bad is a little bit uh misleading in the sense that there were layoffs, but this hasn't resulted. Still, 2023 was a great year for technology companies in terms of stock performance, revenue growth, quarterly performance, and so on. So I think that the the, the layoffs, that affected a lot of people in, in our industry, especially early in the year. Uh, uh, on LinkedIn, you would see uh, uh, every other week uh, somebody... Uh, posting that they they had been affected by layoffs in large companies. Some companies did a great job replacing or uh, 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 helping uh, reposition their their employees. Other didn't do that well. But I think that this was an, more an indication, as Loy said, uh, a conservative approach to control cost in order to increase profits. It was not something like we're laying off because our business is going down because clients are not buying my products because the economy, we have a recession. This is a topic that uh, everybody talks about the recession that never happened. It's like waiting for Godot or waiting for Guffman, uh, the guy that never shows up. <clears throat> and is this recession that we haven't had and we've been waiting for it for two years and we looks like we're in a soft landing. So I think that there is a, 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 a silver lining to this. I would see this as more of a repositioning rather than uh, a, a, a very bad uh, situation for the industry. Yesterday, RWS, uh, who has a fiscal year, which has a, a fiscal year that ends on September 30th, 30th reported their, their revenues for 2023. And... Uh, they were basically, and what they describe in the, the their, their investor call was basically revenue is down 2%. 2% is zero. Uh, uh, it's, it's not really a major change. It's a stable organization. They described that the first half of the year was uh, slower than the second half and things tend to be recovering and that 2024 is going to be better. So uh, I think that... Uh, it wasn't necessarily bad. That's what I want to say. Yeah, I, I, and I think that are mostly over. Yeah, yeah. Dave. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say everything he said, um, but but of course, you know, you know the realignment bit that uh, Renato was talking about. You know, I think that is realignment for growth now. So it's become this kind of pivot of initial realignment um you know strategies and teams have been assessed but with the kind of right where are we going there's an environment of change which we'll get to in this conversation which is high flux but what is our strategy to you know go through those waves and we're seeing that kind of realignment for growth um value analysis right so uh, more intensive value analysis uh, is is happening both at the front end on net new business but more scrutiny you know um Five years ago, uh, security questions for technology in this space wasn't a very long list. Now it's a 300 plus question list, right? So the, those things, I think, have fed into realignment, strategic realignment. And, um, you know, of, of course, there's been a rethink through some of the generative AI stuff as well. What can we use it for and what don't we need? Sure, right? Marketing and other departments. But we, we've also seen a real let's go back to setting up success factors for growth and getting back to business as normal in, in the last number of months. Um, I, I will just briefly mention that uh, people know Lingoport mostly for tools, but but we also deliver a lot of services, um, uh, IT&N consulting kind of projects. And uh, IT&N tends to be uh, very uh, uh, economic outlook sensitive and so um, because 
people don't invest in some ITN initiative if they're uh, in in a defensive posture. They're they're a, a little. It, it's very much forward looking. But then when you, I, I actually think it's a damn good um, uh, indicator for the economy, uh, although it's anecdotal, just one company. But when people start to light up ITN consulting, it's really a sign of something good coming up. And the second half of the year, our consulting has just, you know, kind of ramped, you know, way up. So whereas product is just, you know, sort of more predictable, but consulting does a lot more of this, you know. Anyway, let's keep going. It's not about me. I just can't resist. All right. Um, the elephant in the room. Okay. Uh, everybody's been talking about AI. Um, I remember sort of being amused when somebody at Loke World was like, oh my God, are we going to have a job? Um, but let's, let's really talk about it. Let's, let's address it uh, head on. Um, let's go in the same order again. How about I call on you first, Lloyd? Okay. So, you know, I think we, this, I was at Loke World this last year, and it was, it was interesting to hear a lot of the conversation around this. But I think what most of us are experiencing, certainly on the client side, which I think ripples to the supplier side, is our leaders are all looking for every place that AI can go in the business, be used in the business. Like, is there some place we can use this that we're not using it? So I think so much of the last year has been experimentation, figuring out, can we use it? Where can we use it? Where should we use it? You know, what guardrails to put around it? And I would, I would wager almost all of my peers are in a similar position that we are in, which is as a localization team, one of the first and most obvious places to look when we're talking about this kind of uh, capability because we've been sort of in the field for a while dabbling with, you know, neural MT and, and all that fun stuff. So, so we're the obvious first target, I think in, in all of our, you know, client side companies to show what's possible and what can we do? And so I would tell you that my team's initiatives starting um, really last quarter, the, the end of last quarter through all of next year are super focused on how do we leverage these capabilities? How do we grow our usage? Where does it make sense? You know, we're looking into, um, you know, evaluation, assessment. Those are good places to see, you know, how is our, you know, upstream in our process? How do we know what we're going to MT is any, is going to be any good coming in? So we know what to focus on reviewing on the back end and how do we know on the back end what's going to be good stuff? So we're definitely looking at those places within our processes where we will be, I would say, infusing the capabilities within our standard work. I think we're also looking at the ways that sometimes work has always come through us. So if I think about MT work, it traditionally, somebody knocks on our door or we connect the pipes, we get that work directly as a team. And I think we're gonna be into a brave new world space, many of us, where work will bypass us, where we'll go directly from Gen AI to our trained MT engines, and some things might not even pass through our team. And I think in some cases, those are things that we just wouldn't have done in the past. So I don't feel like that's going to happen to a critical marketing campaign. But I think that can definitely happen to the things that we just would have never done before. So that's a little bit of what kind of what we're seeing, uh, I would say, in maybe the client side and certainly in, in our space. OK, so what do you feel like the AI will be good for in particular? I think it's I think it there's a sweet spot in in assessing what is a good candidate for like neural MT and a sweet spot on the back end for how good do we think the results are. I think there's a fabulous sweet spot upstream in making the content better that comes to us, which brings its whole a whole <laughs> new risk if everybody upstream redoes all their content and sends it through to us. <laughs> there's that. Um, I also think on the, you know, voice, tone, style, quality assessment on the tail end in quality review, it can be, it could be a very useful, it could be useful. So there's, to me, I don't see it today replacing how we're translating 
and and how we're using MT today, at least not yet, but I see it peripherally supporting our processes to hopefully make it possible for us to do more. I, I, I look at what we're going through as an industry here, kind of like we looked at MT in the past and kind of like we looked at translation memory in the past. Initially, we're all panicked about what it's gonna do about our jobs, but ultimately in the end, it's it always results in more work, just lots and lots and lots more work. So I don't see the different work, way. right, Lloyd? No work it, it, coming our way. I see there's a wave coming at us yeah. that we never saw before, and that you know, how do we accommodate that? How do we scale for that? It's it's a little bit of different work. Uh, uh, it, yeah. it changes how we do it, but it's more work. Yes. <laughs> Dave, I'm going to call on you this time. Uh, next, rather than last. The, and you got me unaware as well. That, that's what AI is doing to us, right? We're, we're being <laughs> caught out. And, um, <laughs> you, you know, I liked what you said about 640K. Uh, I actually thought four meg of RAM was just plenty in my PC no, uh, quite a number of years ago. But, you know, 640 is pushing it a bit too much. Um, you, you know, I, I think we may look back at a lot of this and say, hey, that's just another tool in the cupboard, right? Um, I remember finding an image editing tool called Earphone View 28 years ago, let's say, and I use it still. It's a great tool. It does image editing. I know how to use it. We've all got little tools like that. So I have a feeling this will add to our tool stack. Um, I was trying to think on the hype bit about, you know, what innovations were uber hyped and fell on their face, right? So I think they call it uh, Cephean tech, right? Uh, after the Greek character Cephean pushing the boulder Sisyphus. up the hill. Yeah. Sisyphus, yes. Irish pronunciation right here. Thanks, Renata. <laughs> um, so, you know, the segue... Remember the segues? Anyone remember those? 3D Cinema had four attempts so far to establish in itself, right? It's probably going to go again. Um, and, and 3D printing, does that fit into that? So I'm wondering whether there's some aspect of generative that, um, you know, taking the technology S curve adapts into adaptive, which are the next version. And then we take some of it and some of it gets left behind. So I expect that the tool sets will get added to, um, but, you know, common sense will prevail. And what's it good for um, at the moment? Uh, let me give you an example. I needed 30 titles for blogs. So I asked one of the engines, I said, hey, I need a blog that does this. Did it. After five minutes of a conversation, very enlightening conversation, I got my 30 titles and I just had to do editing work on those now. So uh, another example was I needed an image for a blog, which Google search wouldn't have found me because it was a blog about uh, speaking tips, and I wanted to create the idea of fear when someone goes on stage, right? So I needed an angry tennis ball coming at me really fast, instilling fear. So Gen AI could develop that for me. So I think those type of tasks, so control tasks, right? Specific controllable tasks, yes. Unfettered scale, no. Renato. Well, this is a fascinating conversation. I keep thinking about this topic constantly. Uh, I, I, I take a combination of, of the comments that uh, Dave and Loy indicated. We're very early on in the development curve of the technology. We are way past, I'm talking specifically about the localization industry. One of the things that Loy indicated which we see across the board is that AI is not uh, uh, something that affects our industry, especially it affects every industry, everybody, every profession, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we're not special. So we are actually have some advantage because, and I, it doesn't hurt repeating the, the, the T in GPT is transformer, which is a technology that was developed by Google for neuro machine translation, which was the big, uh, the elephant in the room until a year ago was neuro machine translation that was going to kill the translation industry. And then uh, generative AI showed up and everybody forgot about neuro machine translation, which is our salvation right now, because it's better than, uh, than uh, GPT. 
But I think that there are two, two elements uh, from, from the point of view that we're discussing. First of all, there is no proven killer application of Gen AI in the localization industry. There are indications that the good areas of application are in quality estimation and quality control. So uh, uh, how do we uh, uh, optimize a very inefficient part of our process, which is the, the QA process, which is trying to catch errors. Maybe we're going to move our industry from this traditional approach of uh, measuring success by the uh, how, how fewer mistakes I can make than my, my enemy, my competitor, to how better, how, how good, uh, how, how, how successful our content is, instead of measuring in terms of errors and mistakes, which is something that I always been uncomfortable with. The other, so I think that there are two factors in how um, AI affects the localization industry. I think, first of all, it's another stage in developing and improving productivity. It is a productivity tool. We can do more with less. We can uh, 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 do the same more efficiently. Uh, the example of uh, how it affects the quality of the uh, um, <clears throat> original content, it's something that we've been, Acrolynx launched this, I don't know, 20 years ago, where you could uh, uh, evaluate the quality of the source material before you went to translation. And now you can use this easily and send it back. Hey, can you do better? Or we can review content before for translatability and ask the, the internal clients, can we adjust this content to be more translatable and so on? So it is a, a, a productivity improvement. These are the words that I think, and I uh, subscribe to what Dave and Lois said that in, 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 in reality, uh, there's going to be more work for us, but it's going to change. It's going to change the way we, we look at uh, 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 how we uh, uh, generate <clears throat> our deliverables. And finally, I think that more than a technology in itself, very, very fast. And I think that the speed of adoption, the speed of the hype cycle in, 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 in AI is going to bring us earlier to the, the plateau of productivity, which is the, the end of the cycle. Uh, I think that AI is proven to be more of a feature than uh, a, a, a standalone technology. It's going to be something that is embedded in XTM, that it's embedded in Trados, that it's embedded in uh, Google MT, DeepL, or whatever. Uh, in LinguaPort, it's already embedded in, in, in your localizer and your tools, right? So we, as language industry professionals, will not necessarily be engaging with prompting and doing this kind of things it is more going to be there improving our environments and making it uh, something that we click a button and it's solved. It's already happening in, in, in doing, uh, I always, I, I mix your first name and your last name every time, Dave Ruane, and I call you Duane. Dave, <laughs> in my mind. <clears throat> uh, I don't know, how, how is it in, in, in XCM? Is, is this an accurate assessment? I, I think so. I, I think you've hit on a lot of really, you know, key points. Like, I, I really like the the speed of adoption, you know, is, is absolutely what we're seeing. If I can just extract a bit to, let me talk about XDM and then I'll talk about process innovation because um, there's two separate perspectives. We actually did um, a quick survey with a customer advisory board that we have at XDM and, and we really wanted to just understand, okay, what's some of the trends that have been impacting you over the past year. And this business as usual, because we did it recently in the last uh, month, it that was coming up, right? We said, well, we're just getting back to things. Automation, faster time to market, that same old stuff. We're still being asked to, to produce on that. Um, more focus on doubling down with machine translation solutions with that mix of automation and human post-editing 
Uh, and then audiovisual, right? More audiovisual stuff is coming downstream. So abilities, uh, ways to connect those into either best of breed tools or have some kind of capability in that space. They 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 were coming up, uh, but some of them actually address the API, the AI hype, not API, uh, as having a significant impact in their business, right? So as Laura you said, uh, maybe from top down, uh, if it did, but what what they're also said was. Their organizations have been telling them is if it doesn't have a solid background in the data, then there's pushback, right? So data is what's driving decision making. So that show me the truth, make the business case, show me the ROI, and then we can talk, right? So I think that sort of level of sanity is coming back in. And last point on this, from a process innovation challenge perspective, we we used to see uh, new innovations come maybe twelve to eighteen months. They'd arrive in our platform. Uh, which is kind of a Shark Tank platform, if you haven't seen it, anyway. Um, and now we've seen them within months and sometimes weeks. So in the last final, just two months ago in Silicon Valley at Lock World, um, we saw four of the fi six finalists had actual Gen AI embedded in their solution, and it was a working solution. So um, I think to your point, Renato, building them into the engines that exist that's going to be part of what happens, right? Yeah. People are going to have the chassis and this is going to be a new engine that gets plugged in, plugged out probably at some stage as well. Uh, but definitely we're seeing that that speed that you spoke about of adoption really increasing. Yeah, I, I so agree with you. I think we expect it. I think on the client side, it's like, okay, when's it coming? When's it coming? We need it yesterday. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would add just a comment to this is that, uh, um, AI is expensive. Uh, we have this uh, fantasy because we interact with ChatGPT that it's free or it's twenty dollars a month, and that uh, is what is going to work on an enterprise level. And um, I, I I read something about Siemens, and I think it was Constantine Branch who who wrote. He went to. A, uh, a, a hackathon or something at Siemens where they wanted to decide where they were going to spend uh, their money on AI. And they had tons of projects. None of them dealt with translation. They were doing with uh, activities that would save uh, uh, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in, in their businesses. And in our industry, a significant saving in an enterprise for translation and localization would be maybe in the single millions of dollars. And in many, many, many cases, it would be in the tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the impact of savings uh, for, uh, if you have to choose, where am I going to spend my GPUs? It's not going to be in localization. I'm going to be spending my GPUs, my GPU time, and and the cost of enterprise uh, uh, solutions in AI in something that has a much bigger impact in pr production, in uh, development, in in areas that will affect the the, the balance sheet and the PNL in a much more significant way than localization, which, as we know. Uh, doesn't show up in the financial reports of large companies, and it's usually a rounding error, right? It's it's in the the 373.6 billion. We're not in the 0.6 even. We're <laughs> further down. So this is the kind of it's stuff that we, we need to look at. Huh? It's important to us. It's Our important to us. It's, it's scary to us. To us. Yeah. Yes. You, you know, let, let me um, just mention, uh, you posted a video, I think I saw it yesterday, maybe you posted it yesterday, of you speaking in Portuguese and the uh, AI mechanism had overdubbed English yes. and even moved your lips to, um, so it looked like yeah. you were speaking English. It was a, a little off, but it was pretty, it was really pretty good. And yeah, I actually did three that, videos. That's not a yeah. feature. That's a deliverable. So yes, and yeah. but it's not. Uh, um, it's very early in the process. Mm -hmm. There are lots of of 
of exceptions and conditions and so on, it's going to get better. But there is one thing, right? Uh, and, and this is a pattern that I have seen in our industry for uh, about four or five years ago, I stopped talking about trends and started talking more about patterns because things follow a certain structure. <laughs> So what happens is that we get super excited with a new technology and we get scared with this new technology and we believe that it's going to replace the existing te technologies. And what happens is that all these new technologies are coexisting and you create more complexity and you create different people moving at different speeds and, and you have a reality that is not this visionary reality that everything, everybody's going to embrace all these new technologies and so on. Uh, even the most, let's say, uh, 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 inclusive, uh, disruptive, uh, changing technology that we have, the cell phones, they're not cell phones anymore because we seldom talk on it. It's These are devices. And even there, you have two competing systems, a uh, hundred different brands, and... Uh, 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 not everybody is working on the latest. I, I, I have, well, knowing you, Adam, you probably are using an iPhone 8 still or something like that. Maybe you were, 14. You were at, at the 12. 14, not for, but 14, the mini. 14, okay. The mini. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I got the last uh, mini. Uh, not everybody is moving at the same speed. And this is where a service market like ours strives is dealing with this complexity variability uh, even inside your own organization and, and yeah. I, i'm speculating here loy i imagine that you have different departments that are working with different processes and different systems and so on because changing an enterprise solution takes a long long time it uh, takes uh, time changing an yeah, ERP yeah. system changing a financial system it's a five-year effort, and then you're married to it for 20 years, right? So yeah. the fact that AI came and it's possible and has a lot of promise doesn't mean that everybody's going to adopt it. So I chill. I think that we'll be fine. <laughs> I, you know, I have to jump on. I have to jump on the um, the dubbing, the language dubbing thing, and some of that tech. To me, I think that's one of those areas where. Today, that's super expensive, and it's a very small group of people that do that work and very specialized. It's, you know, it's a it's a single threaded, high quality craft process, and that's pretty much what it's been for all these years. When you introduce this kind of tech in that space, what I really, I don't think that will go away. I think there will always be the people who need to, you know, there's somebody who needs to voice Tom Hanks and somebody that yeah. needs to voice other superstars, like that's not going to go away. But I do think it's an interesting space in that today we say no to so many of the requests that we get to dub something because we look at the cost and it's like, show us the data that this makes sense, right? Because it's very expensive. We'll subtitle that for you, you know? So but, a lot uh, of Lloyd, our, this is just like machine space. translation. This democratizes that. It changes yeah, exactly. that game. It, yeah. it means all the stuff we said no to, we'll be saying yes to. Right. And it's like I used to say that machine realize. translation replaced zero translation. Machine translation exactly. replaced that translation that was never going to be done. And exactly. this is what and new, new technology is. what we say no to most of the time. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And I believe that's what all of these, these kinds of innovations generally do is they just broaden the amount of work that comes our way um, and create interesting challenges on how you manage and control. Like, do you want to try to control what never touches your org and how do you control what doesn't touch your org? You know, instead of things coming through our pipeline, are we monitoring sites now to see, are they really using, do we have our, you know, our tools plugged in there and we're leveraging it and we can see how good that content is or not. So to me, I think the, how we monitor, how we manage will shift for those use cases and the volume and the type of work and the solutions that we offer will just continue to expand. I don't think it means we get more money. I don't think it means we get bigger budgets. I think it just means we're doing more things with our budget because that's pretty much what it always has meant, right? We always just do more for what we have.
But I also think that it means on the supplier side, a readjustment maybe, but I still think it's going to result in more work on the supplier side. I just don't see it going away. I see it just getting bigger. I, I, I see my stakeholders deciding that they want to post a website in six personas, you know? <laughs> it's like, okay. I, <laughs> like I, that's, I, that's stuff yeah. that is easy. Now that nobody Guys, we would... need to we move we need to move on to the next slide. Okay. Uh, I, I want to leave at least fifteen minutes for questions. Uh, I'm going to mention that we only have one question asked so far. It's a very good question. Uh, uh, so I want to invite you. Don't wait till the end to ask the questions. You probably have questions in your mind now. Don't worry about asking a question that ends up getting answered in the discussion. That's fine. All right. So here we go. All right. So. Um, boy, this lawyer, you're the star here again. Uh, what what do customers want? In everything. Everything. <laughs> okay. They want everything. They want more of it, and they want it to be easier. You didn't mention <laughs> price. You said everything. Oh, they do want it. Yeah, well, price matters. Well, they just want it to be free. They want us to for it. <laughs> they want it all, and they want it to be super easy. <laughs> I can probably tell you what customers don't want. And, you know, th this will lead into this whole kind of lawyer you were talking about, you know, more scale of content and ability for content to be produced. Well, is that owned content? Is it earned? Is it who, who owns the assets? Because at some point, if there's an issue with that content, because one part of it went through some unfettered LLM, then who mm -hmm. deals with that, right? So exactly. where, where's the brand impact? And I think that, that, that that's, you know, I think, Renato, you were mentioning it earlier as well. We're kind of waiting to see, will there be a headline in some months real soon where, you know, someone used an LLM, it's cost, create an insulting translation uh, and this gets out. And then apart from the the problem for that company and that team, Hopefully, people doesn't happen, right? Such a word. But nobody else wants to be the person in another organization who gets asked by their boss, are we using those LLMs? Do you know this? Right. So this kind of risk mitigation and understanding what systems are being used, the provenance of systems, I think mm -hmm. is going to be a, a big deal. And, and I think that will be part of what customers will want in the future is that can you prove to me that you are using well-controlled systems and that you can um, you know, stand over everything that comes through. Uh, I'll just mention one thing before passing the baton on. Uh, I did like uh, a really nice concept from an innovation lab from Creative Words, Italian company, who many of you will know. They came up with this idea of human approved, right? So a kind of a certification stamp that it's being human approved. And I think the question we all ask is, are we gonna be wondering when we see any content does it have that kind of stamp in the future renata uh, renata nimsey has a webinar with tuck uh, tucker with uh, creative words coming up uh, so um probably uh, yeah you, you yeah. know better than i do <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I look at these things before we have these events so. <laughs> I sound like I know what I'm talking Thank about. Thank you. Thank you for the plug <laughs> for Tucker. <laughs> right. and, anyway. and I should also mention Translated uh, won, won an award for their human touch um, uh, video that they showed at uh, uh, local. An amazing video. It makes me yeah, cry every video. time I watch it. Right? <laughs> but uh, let, 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 let me uh, comment on on on. I think that there are two important points in this in this conversation. One is we don't create anything, right? So our risk of creating problems within our process is relatively low. This this concern with uh, security and uh, 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 problems in in content and so on. They have happened. Uh, you know the stories of the lawyers who had invented cases, and you had the story of I don't remember which company where I think they translated Arabs as terrorists or or or, or things like that. Uh, 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 but they they always happen. It's but it's scarce. the The point is that the the risk for the localization industry in this part is low because we're inheriting 
content and we have translation memories and we have a uh, neuro machine translation that doesn't necessarily hallucinate, which is the, 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 the problem with LLMs is hallucinations. And uh, 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 the risk of this happening if we have a controlled process is relatively low compared to it happening at the general uh, uh, content development area where if, if it is unsupervised, something is going to get uh, awry, right? But if, if, if we follow the traditional process, somebody else is responsible for that mistake. If it comes with some hallucinations for us to translate, it's not our job to validate if that is correct or not. It actually is an, an opportunity to shy because they say that the only person who reads everything is the translator, right? So <clears throat> this is one of the areas that I think that uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a defense mechanism that we have in the industry to push back on, on open adoption of, of uh, 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 generative AI is the fact that it's very prone to hallucinations. And our systems that are uh, uh, with neuro machine translation that are also AI based are more safe than the traditional one. And I, I, I see, Loy, you, you have a comment on that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, 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 I agree, I, I I agree gotta, with- I gotta move us on, guys. I, I gotta okay, move us God. on. Uh, the, the only thing I'll, uh, we'll come back to it. Uh, okay. The only thing I wanna, wanna mention is when, when Renato, you talk about security, you talk about the security of the content and the correctness of the content. I think if Dave and I were in a room talking about security, we'd be talking about those 46 page spreadsheets that we get sent where we have to answer um, how vulnerable is the system that we're plugging into uh, a company's enterprise. So, so it's two different things. And I will tell you that the corporate level, there the, at the IT level, there's a lot of concern about the the connection to anything new. Now, Chat GPT four Turbo, the four point five, you can get your own private instance. But believe me, there'll be some leak like there was with Google Translate years ago. Anyway. Um, I'm, I got to get us moving along. I'm sorry, Loy. Uh, we got to go quick here. Um, is the future so bright you got to wear shades or um, what's the attitude or, is, or, or are we cautiously moving forward or is it woe is me? Go ahead, uh, Loy, you go first. because. Okay. Well, yeah, I think on. the future looks pretty bright. I think the future looks very busy. <laughs> I would say... Our future, like, you know, the plans that were laid are not the plans that are in place right now. So I think um, maybe bright, but disrupted, bright, but, um, you know, focuses shifted would be what I would say. Good, good. Uh, Renato? I, I, I think that uh, I read recently, it doesn't matter if the glass is half, em half empty or half full, because you can refill it any time you want, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, it's refillable. Uh, and I think we are in this uh, refilling kind of uh, adjustment after one year of, I, 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 I don't like to use disruptive, because disruptive means a complete change in direction, something that changes completely the behavior of an industry. And, and when we're talking about innovations, and I don't think that AI for the localization industry has been disruptive. I think it has been uh, an annoyance, uh, uh, an intrusion, uh, 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 a distraction in many cases, uh, but we are very adaptive. Uh, it's the nature of uh, the type of service that we provide. And uh, I think that the, the conversation in 2024, um, it's, it's in, in, in one of the conversations that we're going to have in 2024 is how to protect the revenue of the service providers in the organization because the per word price is uh, showing signs of, um, Pro, pro, being problematic because the, the the productivity has increased so much. The value in the production chain of an LSP is not more capacity. It's uh, uh, the ability to to process, the ability to manage, the, uh, the ability to uh, uh, deal with complexity, 
right? The word for 2024 is complexity, I think. Okay, very good. And I think to, to become navigators and more consultants, right? And, and to move mm -hmm. up that value chain, like I think that opportunity is massive. You know, linguistic data is now a real asset if it wasn't before. So getting that data house in order is key. Um, so if doing nothing else, I, I think many companies as all part of the chain will, will be involved there. Uh, I was talking to the exec director, Alison Furch of Gala, the Globalization Localization Association, I'm on the board. She mentioned that, you know, this is getting started. It reminds me of a uh, farrier season here where I live in the south of Spain. You know, each town has their own fair and there's flamenco dancing. And by about two months in, you get a little bit better at the dancing, right? I think that's what we're going to see. We're, we're going to see a lot more of it. Changes that this industry had wished for now seem possible. You'll have innovators and creatives come up with ways of productizing it. And then I think you'll, you'll have commoditization happen there. But that's all ahead of us. Um, you know, FOMO may be real, but I mentioned a tool I've had for nearly 30 years. Is there wisdom in waiting and watching? You know, we used to install service packs for a long time because we wanted our build machines way back then to be stable. Will there be a bit of that as well? Very good. Very good. All right. Um, I'm going to let us go to the questions. Um, we have uh, two so far. Let me see here. All right. Uh, uh, the first one uh, came in early. I really like this question. Uh, and it, it's a bit of a segue from what we just, what was just mentioned. What are the trends and expected changing behaviors for localization PMs, project managers, due to AI? I, I I will jump in. I think that uh, the change is going to vary. Uh, and, and I think that there is a, a behavior that every professional in an industry needs to master, which is the ability and willingness to learn. Because everything is changing, the speed of change is accelerating, and the ability to learn and adapt, uh, forget dogmas forget the stuff that you learned in school what you should be learning in school is learning how to learn because whatever i learned in school is obsolete uh even the number of planets so uh be be prepared to 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 be able to change and pivot at any time uh the thing that scares me the most when talking to People is is the, the the this is the way we do it. This is the way we've always done it. Uh, the way you've always done it is is very interesting, but it might not apply for the next project with the same client that you're working. With. Yeah, I would I would jump on this one with, and I don't think this is new. I think we've been doing this already. So to the to the point that this is part of our will be part of our process rather than a you know a whole new thing in many ways. I think we already are asking our stakeholders when they request work of us, you know, what is the expectation for this deliverable? You know, is this going to change minds, influence people, or save the world? Or is this a blog and it's going to last 10 minutes? You know, what is the quality expectation? What is the process that is most appropriate for that work? so that we don't over deliver what we shouldn't on a quality level, or we don't under deliver because we miss the mark on what's important. So to me, from a PM standpoint, that's a question PMs have been asking for forever anyway. So it's just continuing to ask that with some more tools in the bag that also change the outcomes a little bit more than, than what we had in the past. Okay. Uh, very, very good. All right. Oh, we have another question here from, I bet every one of you knows this person. I won't embarrass him by saying his name out loud, but uh, I'll let you know later. Um, this this guy's a real good uh, industry vet veteran. Um, all right. Have any of the presenters, especially Lloyd, had any success convincing English content creators to use Gen AI tools to improve the quality of their source content? If so, what tools are you recommending? Lloyd, we'll let you I, go first. I, I can tell you, my, you know, um, here, 
this is in fact one of the things that is being looked at on the content side of the organization is how we can improve our um, our content with these capabilities. They're not there yet, but that is very much um, just as we are very busy on our end trying to figure out how we plug in the new possibilities. They're doing the same thing, and I think you know from an enterprise standpoint, one of the great places for this is normalizing voice and style across an enterprise. You know, if you work in an enterprise and you have 10 acquisitions and you have you serve every customer, you know, internally, we know that voice tone and style, it's really hard to be consistent across an entire company when you have new products coming in and lots of different creatives and all around the company. To me, that is the magic that could happen upstream with Gen AI is just take this great content that's accurate, that's right, stay in the box and and align it all to the same common voice, tone and style and let that flow through to our systems. Cause we catch it when it's not, when it's not the same. It's like, it's a 14 year old talking here and my grandma's over here and there's accountant in the middle. We have every voice and style, you know, that kind of, of thing happens in large enterprises. So um, I don't know about tools yet. I mean, certainly I've worked with, you know, the teams that I've worked with have often used Acrolinks upstream to help, you know, make the general quality better and more consistent. But I think that um, we're in a brave new world for what's possible when they start applying it across an enterprise level. And I think as as we start seeing that happen, then we will be figuring out how to manage all that content and how to pay for it. Coming our way. Dad. I, I, I just the bigger picture points around that, which is um, needs must. You know, I remember a conversation 15 years ago with the director of localization, the manufacturing company, and he had a meeting with his boss at the time who said, hey, good news, you've got the same budget next year. And then waiting for the boat, uh, you need to do double the volume, right? So when things are mandated, then, you, you know, the tools that are available then get looked at a bit more seriously, right? So when those business objectives are, this is what we got to do as a business to be successful, will those tools help us do it? And I think that is what will drive, um, you, you know, the use of these kind of tools. And and to answer the, the question from James, you know, those tools as well. But I think it's it's the top down business decision making and alignment to KBOs that we're we're just going to see. Well, choose the tools you want, but you know, meet the goals. Renato, oh, my only comment is that uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of people who are using this technology and not uh, really uh, following any standards and, and not telling their bosses and so on. So uh, the rogue use is the, the most common situation here. And I think that this ties very well to the question that went, came up in the chat uh, Adam, yeah. about the use of, uh, of uh, AI in marketing as a replacement for localization. The big problem with this uh, threats that uh, everybody sees is that who is going to do that? Who is going to take the initiative? Who is going to take responsibility? The fact that a technology enables and allows you to do things, and Dave gave some examples early on, doesn't mean that everybody's going to adopt it. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to use it. I've been speaking at events and I ask people everywhere I go, how many of you use ChatGPT every day? Three, four percent of the rooms are going to raise their hand. How many of you have never used it? Used it? Two thirds, seventy percent of the people in the room will raise their, their hands. Uh, so that gives me a little bit of of uh, uh, comfort in the sense that. ChatGPT is not different from anything else. There are the innovators, there are the early adopters, there are the early majority, there's the late majority, and there are the laggards. So there are people who are only going to be interacting with ChatGPT five years from now. So yeah, this is probably take. your bosses, right? Yeah. <laughs> they talk about I, it because they read yeah. about it, but they don't use it. Yes, Lori. Exactly. 
And it's lovely to hear from Victoria. Um, I would add, I would add one thing to this, which is think about the um, some of the language that 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 was born out of the actor strike and the writers strike in Hollywood this last year. And I actually think there is a there is some interesting learning in that, which is you the the recommendation in those spaces was basically we know this is going to come, we know this is going to be in our space, but the creatives should be the ones who get to choose whether or not they use it. So, in other words, a company shouldn't be using you know um, uh, this tech to write a screenplay so that they can do it for free, but a writer who writes screenplays can use it and leverage it as a tool set. And so when I think about this in terms of trans creation and in terms of how we might want to use it, it's similar to using MT as a suggestion. Use it if it makes your job easier. Why wouldn't you, you know? And for a while, it will probably make you be more profitable for you to do that until the whole industry figures out how to monetize all this stuff and it and it becomes like word rates and, and that happens. So I would say, try it, use it, see if it helps you and makes your job shorter. And it's so much better if it's coming from us under our guidance than, than the wild, wild west. So yeah. I think that's I, a great point. If I can just jump in here on, on what Lois said, the I, I I think having there's a great study by David Dunning on competency right and knowing about something to be able to know if someone's good at it I won't go down that rabbit hole too much but uh, having competent people use these tools for their discipline I think that's where we're we're going to see real productivity again mm -hmm. so they have that competence and there's a question in there on developing a, a content development workflow what I would say to that is uh, real quick. Uh, have reviewers add in extra review steps, right, to pilot out what makes sense and, and what AI can actually produce for you and have them validate that. So you've extra review initially, maybe you get productivity once the pilot uh, has gone through, but have competent people managing good tools. Um, yeah, I, I, I would just tell a quick anecdote. Uh, we had a client who started receiving uh, articles translated into 40 languages and asking the localization team to review it for them. And uh, the localization team pushed back and says, no, because this doesn't, we already have a process in place. This uh, material that you created doesn't follow the style guides, doesn't follow the translation memories that we have, doesn't follow any of the process that we have. It's going to be much more expensive for us to uh, review your 40 uh, Gen AI uh, generated translations than for us to translate inside our own process. So uh, sometimes something that sounds good is not really the best solution. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, in terms of playing with AI, one one place for people to start is uh, an app I really like, and I was discussing with Kate, who is behind the little LingoPort logo here. Um, uh, app called uh, Perplexity, and we, we were talking about how that's uh, stuff like that is going to change search because you ask it a question rather than going to Google, and it it brings up the information and also links to the web page that it came, it got that information. But uh, again, Perplexity, I, I think everybody should have that on their phone and you know uh, at their fingertips. Uh, last question. We're going to run over. Uh, 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 I, I hate to leave somebody not getting their question asked. Um, we are developing a content development workflow. Do you have any tips or suggestions? Pretty broad question. You want to go take that one quick? I, I think I part answered it, but just to kind of uh, double down on that one, um, it, it's that idea of adding in more review post any AI step. So if you've got like a five step process, so first draft, edit, review, uh, work and draft and so on that you've just, you test out uh, with, with competent reviewers uh, early on and then just come up with the optimum flow. When, when we playing around with this, we were kind of figuring out what percentage could you, you, you push through AI and then how do you make the content unique? What percentage of editing? I think that's, you got to play with it for each content type. Yeah, I think you could you could experiment during the editing process. 
and okay. and you should probably experiment during the editing process to to stylistic um, compliance. Make it sound like a fourteen year old wrote it. Make it sound like you know a rap star wrote it. Make it sound like you know uh, a doctorate you know mm, wrote it. I, you know, I, pick your style. Yeah. <laughs> what what I would add is that uh, uh, the, the the localization part is a is a loop in this process, right? We have our own processes and steps and uh, incorporate some of them into your workflow. Uh, and uh, this is one of the things that I've seen from different technology providers where uh, Gen AI is um, uh, uh, successful and it's been uh, well used is in quality estimation in the sense that if you go through an, an MTP process, you uh, eliminate a lot of unnecessary review because the the quality is 100%. It's good based on a translation memory, on a good machine translation, based on a style guide, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You are going to reduce the number of uh, segments that you need to have human review for because of the quality estimation that was done by AI. But that requires a lot of prompting, a lot of engineering, a lot of... Uh, RAG processes, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of work to make that happen. It's, it's not like <laughs> auto magic, right? Yes. I, I, I was going to mention that there's a lot of consulting work uh, involved in what you're talking about. Yeah. Nobody has mentioned training the AI for your specific domain of what <laughs> you want to do. What we've seen in the past with uh, machine learning is that it doesn't work unless you, you know, it's got a lot of promise, but unless you really take the time to train it and train it on the specific need of what you're doing, not just like the general world, it may not relate to your particular task at hand. Uh, well, it may be a distraction. So that's the cautionary part. I, I, I do think there's a lot of consulting work available in this in, in this domain. Uh, that should, there should there was a great ad that uh, Kate actually shared uh, with us, Adam, um uh -huh. from fiverr right so fiverr is i think it, most people right. know it's a marketplace for freelance services right and they had some actors on a poster if you like and text on top of one of the actors was ai took my job and then the subtext underneath was to the next level and are we going to see <laughs> you know people skilling up and getting this new competence and then being able to say that um fiverr is betting on it. Yeah, yeah, very good. All right, uh, I, we've, we've ran a little over. I wanna thank so many of you stayed with us the whole time. Thank you to our guests, this was really fun. We'll have to do this again, maybe in six months or something and kind of revisit the topic of 2024. Um, there are some uh, great links from uh, Kate in the, in the chat. Uh, so uh, uh, grab those real quickly because we're gonna close the webinar. Thank you again, all of you. This was really a pleasure to put together and uh, I'm reading all your comments on the chat. A lot of hellos from around the world, a lot of complimentary uh, 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 add-ons and uh, I'll share that with the panelists also after once I can pull that down. Uh, thank you to Kate, who's behind the Lingoport logo, who makes all of this work and uh, happy holidays to everybody. All right. Take Thanks. care, everyone. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, right. Adam. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Adam.